If you turn to Psalm 63 this morning, Psalm 63, and I'm going to read just the first, very first verse of Psalm 63. We're talking here today about digging and drawing from wells. So we look at the first verse that says, O God, you are my God, and early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. Lord, I just pray that you be with us today as we look in your word, as we consider the things that you have given us for our own lives. And Lord, that you would be present, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate to us your message, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You know, my wife and I don't have much in terms of TV watching. Um, we either do one of two things. We either watching nature documentaries, or once in a while, um, it'll be uh, Hallmark, <laughs> which my wife always starts, then falls asleep on, and while I'm reading, doing something, and then the next time she puts the same thing on, says, we didn't see this. I said, oh yeah, we did. But she didn't. But nature documentaries is something that we would be doing if it's not that, and I might be interested in that. And one animal that's actually particularly interested in is the African elephant. I had opportunity several times when being in Africa to see these great animals. But, you know, elephants, like many other animals, they're migratory. They sort of follow the water, depending on the season that they're in. And they have this incredible memory, unlike us, you know, they, they are leading their extended family to watering holes where they drank from in the past. And at times of severe drought, they might come to these places that they had drunk from in the past, but they also find these to be dry. And it's one thing about the attribute of the elephant is that they sense where water is and they will actually dig in those places to discover water. Uh, that's actually below the surface level. And so not only do they get refreshed from the water from where they dug this, this area, but also the holes actually give access for other animals to follow them after that and drink as well. I think we can learn a lot from this activity as our own Christian life experience. You know, when, when the psalmist here declares that everything around him seems dry, I know this never happens to any of us here, but just provide, think that if it did, what would you do? I want to begin by making a declaration first that there is a provision for the people of God for every season of our life. Amen? And so we look at this, and our tendency is that we might give up in those dry seasons instead of pressing on. And, and But God can supply our needs in every season. That's something we have to do. He can sustain us with his river. Amen? So in the wilderness, obviously water needs to be drawn from wells or springs of living water. And we know from the scriptures that one day when Jesus went to the great feast, that he stood there and he cried out and he said this, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture had said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And this he said concerning the spirit. In believing in him, those that would believe in him would receive. But the Holy Spirit wasn't given yet because Jesus had not been glorified. But I want you to notice that it wasn't the outpouring rain of the Spirit of God that he was talking about that we experience in the desert. <coughs> it's the water that needs to be drawn up from the wells of the, of the earth or, or from the heart. In this dry place, it's kind of important that we draw the water of refreshing from the fountain of well of God. You know, because a lot of times we're praying, God, pour out your spirit. God, pour out your spirit. You know, we want this sort of thing to happen out here. And God's saying something needs to happen from in here. There needs to be a, a drawing up. This is what Jesus said to the woman at the well of Samaria in John chapter 4. He says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. 
but the water that I shall give him will become in him or in her a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. This is the water that Jesus promises. It isn't just like the shower that's going to happen out here. When the shower happens, everybody gets wet. But he's saying here that as his people, we've got to learn to draw upon the well of salvation. We've got to draw upon this river that God has given to us. I want you to notice that in John 7, 39, when Jesus was speaking at that grace feast, he spoke of the well source being the spirit of the Lord. And he also said here that out of the heart will flow rivers. It's plural. It's not just singular. This will flow from your heart. And it's interesting, you know, the spirit of the Lord manifests himself in several ways. We look in Isaiah 11, verse 2, and it says, The spirit of the Lord rests upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. See, here the spirit is called many things, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the, the fear of the river is of the fear of the Lord. And you read other scriptures like Proverbs 18, 4 that says, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The wellsprings of wisdom is a flowing brook. Those are things we speak has something to do with this river that's flowing within us. And then in, in Proverbs 16, 22 says, understanding is a wellspring of life to him who has it, but the correction of fools is folly. And in Proverbs 25 says, counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. So you can see in these rivers, there's wisdom, there's understanding, there's, there's counsel. These are rivers and, and, and these wells are resident in the heart of a spirit-filled believer because that's where the spirit of God dwells. That's where he abides. And, and it's only the man or the woman who understands the ways of the Lord that will draw the waters out of this well. And, I, and this is a key word, I believe, is this word draw. There's a drawing that needs to place. The, the waters of refreshing in the wilderness do not come from the rain of the Spirit, but must be drawn from the heart. It says in Proverbs 10, 11, the mouth of the righteous is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. You know, what we speak, how we understand, the counsel that we give are not only deep water from us, but they're also water for others. You didn't hear that, did you? What are you saying that's bringing a river of water to somebody else? Are, are, we, are we concerned about how we speak? Are we concerned about how we bring understanding to a situation? Are we concerned about the counsel that we give to other people? Because all of those things are part of the river that's within us. Even our own understanding for our life, how we begin to work through the situations of our life, we must understand the things of God. When we reject the counsel of someone who, who is led by the Spirit, what we're doing is we're cutting off the counsel of God, and that's a much-needed river. That's a refreshment. That's something that we so desperately need. I know we live in this independence in America, and unfortunately, there's too much of this independence in the church. We, we think we don't need anybody, and we so easily cut off everybody but the person you're cutting off might be the very well of salvation, the very well of the water of refreshment that you need for that season. In, in Isaiah 12, 3 says, therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. I'm sure that you and I can recall several instances when we have gone to pray in a dry season and find it difficult. Is it only me or is it anybody else experienced some of these things? You know those times where, where nothing seems fresh and you're going through the exercise because you're doing so by faith, but you're not seeming like you're getting anywhere. Maybe you, you don't feel refreshed and you're praying in the spirit and you're still feeling dry. 
And your thoughts tell you that you must be in the wilderness because God brought you there in some way and he's not going to take you out till he's ready to take you out. And maybe you give up and you stop seeking during those times. After all, if God put you there, nothing's going to change till he brings you out. That's how some people think. This is wrong thinking. This is erroneous thinking. You're, you're thinking of quitting instead of pressing on. And this kind of thinking is somehow you believe that, well, God brought you in this place to frustrate you, to get you to give up until somehow he works out his sovereign will in your life. Look, the wilderness was never intended to be place you in a place of failure. When God brings you in the place of wilderness, it's to bring you into a place of victory. And it's important in times like this that we keep fighting. We keep pressing on. We need to have some little bit of spark of fire in us and, and life and ask God, stir up the gift that's in us like Paul told Timothy, stir up that gift. Amen. You know, from the laying on of hands, he says, stir it up. We need to begin to prophesy to ourselves, you know, come forth the river of living water, spring up in me, oh well. Come forth, river of God. There's some old songs we used to sing, and I, I'll tell you, my heart's on some of those old songs. Some of you can remember this, a song we used to sing many years ago. Spring up, oh well, within my soul. Spring up, oh well, and make me whole. Spring up, oh well, and give me to me that life abundantly. Yet we begin prophesying to us, and then we sing, there's the river of life flowing out of me, right? Yes. None of you heard that song before? Yes. Why don't you sing it with me? Give to me that life abundantly. There's a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the blind to walk and the line to see. There's a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well. We gotta prophesy to ourselves, right? We need to begin to say, hey, look, there's a life in me, and we need to begin to prophesy that. See, the, the Lord commanded Moses, tell the children of Israel to go in this place. And so in Numbers 21, 16 and 17, it says here, they went to Burr, which is the well where the Lord said to Moses, gather the people together, I will give them water. And then Israel sang this song, spring up, oh well. And all of them began to sing this. You know, perhaps we need to do this in our own prayer lives right now. You know, perhaps God wants to manifest himself in us through our lives. And in Proverbs 15, 23 says, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season. How good it is. The confession of our mouth can bring edification. The confession of our mouth can also bring despair. Which way is it being? How are we using what we're doing? See, if we walk away from the pursuit of God, if we quit when things seem dry, and we say, well, you know, I'm in this dry place and nothing's going to change, we stay in a state of heaviness. But God, when he speaks to your heart, he gives us joy, the joy that's needed to, to draw out from the well. We can tap that well of salvation. We can draw the water refreshing. It's like drinking cool water from the spring in the middle of a desert. God wants to do that in our lives. But many people give up in dry times. But God is saying this, he's saying this church, keep pressing onward, don't stop. We, we may need to have this persistence, we need to have this little bit of tenacious drive within us that won't let us stop until God's will is done in our lives. Many people stop praying when they feel dry. 
They stop because no water is coming from the wells and it, it seems too difficult to obtain and, and you can't expect waters to come if, if, if you never open up your mouths in prayer. We need to exercise faith. We need to trust the Lord. We might feel, you know, but God wants our, our strength built up and he wants it built up so that the battles that we're gonna face in the future will be stronger. And just because we don't feel his prayer, in, 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 his presence in a prayer closet doesn't mean that he's denying us. He's drawing us. He wants us to draw near him so that he'll draw near us. In Genesis 26, the first 18 verses of that chapter, we find Isaac in a place of dryness. And the first three verses, it says there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines in Gerah, and then the Lord appeared to him and said, go, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands. I'll perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. God here specifically tells Isaac, do not run to Egypt. Don't go to Egypt where it's comfortable. Stand in the land where I've led you to. Many times we find ourselves in a dry place and the first thing that comes to mind is, I'm getting out of here. If it's dry in the prayer closet, well, we think of all the things that we need to do that day and we leave the prayer closet. If it seems dry in the church we attend, thought comes, I'm going someplace else where there's a, a move of God. If it seems as dry in our social life, our business life, you know, the thought of leaving and finding a city where there's some better economic prosperity comes to mind. And we think if we stay here, we're just going to dry up. And we'll never see the plan of God fulfilled in our lives. You know, there's so many Christians that do just that. Can I let you know that if you never find God's provision in dry places, You'll always be thirsty. And wherever you go, the problem's not there. It's in here. Because God wants us to find him and draw from the wells that he gives us wherever we are. Many people run from one activity to another, from church to church, from city to city. They're trying to find some place, a church, a city, whatever, a place that's not dry. But instead of digging the wells and allowing God to use them in place and bring the refreshment in that dry place, they're going to seek a place of ease. What they don't really realize is that many of these instances, God intends to bring forth his vision and he's given them right there in that dry place. In fact, you know that we are all part of the solution in these times. Look what happens here to Isaac as a result of obeying God and staying in the land of famine. It says in, in verse 12 to 15, Isaac sowed in that land and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper. He continued prospering until he became very prosperous for he had possessions of flocks, possessions of herds, great numbers of servants. So the Philistines envied him. And now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servant had dug in the days of Abraham his father, that they had filled them with the earth. And verse 18 says, Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he called them by the names which his father had called them. See, the water that Isaac needed for his crops to grow was obtained by redigging the wells that his father had once dug. These wells were plugged up by the Philistines. And over a period of time, what happened is the enemy had stopped the wells that would have been the provision for Isaac for that season. 
And just as with Isaac, the water that we so desperately need for the growth of God's incorruptible seed to mature in our hearts must be drawn from these stopped up wells. Worldliness presented in the church, the body of Christ has really stopped many wells. A church that once was fruitful can become dry because it's allowed the enemy to seduce it. I've been studying in this whole area of progressive Christianity, and I can tell you this, it's an off-ramp to Christianity altogether. It's not a way on, it's a way off. Most people that follow that route become atheists after this. And it's incredible how it's seduced. I watch one advertisement for a church that's in this vicinity. And when I begin to look at that, I said, their whole advertisement is really advertising towards progressive Christianity. It's a relationship without the Lord. And, and you know what, it's funny, they use the same terminology that we do, but it means something different. God wants to restore us back to where we once were or to advance us to the place that we have yet to experience. But we need to understand his truth. We need to stop up these wells. And so, you know, this applies to us personally as a church, as a whole, as, as, as individuals. It says in Isaiah 58, 11 to 13, it says, the Lord will guide you continually. Isn't that a good thing? That God doesn't stop guiding us? And he will satisfy your soul in drought. It's another good thing. And he will strengthen your, your ones and shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. What a promise that God has that we follow him. He will always be providing this. But then it says this, those from among you shall build the old waste places and shall raise up of the foundations of many generations. And you shall be called the repair of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from, not, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him. Not doing your own ways, not finding your own pleasure, not speaking your own words. Ah, God's got this great promise that he'd keep watering us. But if we violate his command, if we violate where we don't hold the Sabbath as something important to us. You know, for many churches, like an option these days. It's the option depending on if nothing else better is happening. You know, we, we haven't made this sort of commitment that we can come and, and that our day is to please the Lord, it's not to please ourselves. And so Isaac didn't seek his own way. He, he, he wasn't seeking his own pleasure. He didn't go to the land of Egypt where he could, things could have been easier for him. And we, if we will not do things our own way, if we won't seek our own pleasure, if we won't speak our own words, but we choose to honor God, God promises this. He'll be like a watered garden. We will be. We will be like a spring of living water. We, we will be people where the waters don't fail. God can bring his living water to dry and thirsty places, but he's going to do it through us. It says here, we are the people that are called to build up old waste places. We are the people called up to raise the foundation of many generations. We are the people that are called to be the repairers of the breach. We are the people that are called to be the restorers of the streets to dwell in. I mean, look at these key words, build up, raise up, repair, and restore. These are things God's calling us to do. How is he going to do that? By honoring him. By digging those wells again. You know, we, we need to get this, this shovel out. You know, God wants us, he's leading us, redig those wells so that the world that's plugged up, you know, that we need to have study to show ourselves approved. We, we need to have discernment. We need to have trust in him so we can understand the times that we're living in. And again, this is going to take persistence. It may take longer than an hour to reopen a well. It may take longer than two hours. It may take longer than a day. It may take longer than a week. So you say, well, Pastor Ron, 
How long is it going to take? The answer is it shouldn't matter to us. Just keep digging until you tap something. There will be many times when it's not done in one season of prayer. You'll have to pick it up again the next time you come into that prayer closet, but keep digging, keep praying, keep trusting. In my own observation in the church and in working with many other churches, there are many Christians who have allowed their wells to be plugged up. They've settled into comfortability. And the alarming fact is this is a majority. This is not the minority. This, this is a condition. Let me ask you, when was the last time you participated in something other than a Sunday service? Go to a Bible study. Go to a fellowship. You know, anything. Invite somebody to your house. When was the last time? What would happen if all of us were stirred up? If all of us stirred up the gift of God in us and allowed that to be released, homes would be changed. Churches would be changed. America would be changed. We thank God for a, a ruling that took place today, oh yeah, uh, this week, uh, with the Supreme Court. But don't put your trust in the changing of laws to change America. People have to change. We have laws for the speed limit. How many of you follow it? How many ouches did I just hear? Laws don't change people. God changes people. Amen? I'm thankful for laws that are more aligned with his laws. That's a great thing, and we should always keep working towards that. But we need the heart of America changed. The gift of God is lying dormant in many homes, in churches, and in our nation. You say, well, why? Because the wells are plugged up, while at the same time we boast that we're spirit-filled. The church will not be revived unless we as individuals are revived. The church isn't just an organization, it's a people of God. And the condition of the people really becomes the condition of the church. I think it's time that we take out our shovels and start doing some digging and removing those things that have stopped up the well, that have stopped up the wells of God, you know, whatever it is in our life, whatever we've done to, to somehow settle into something that's comfortable, but in the reality is, it's caused the dryness that we've experienced. It's time we stop prophesying to our spirit. Remember when David was struggling and he said, you know, why is my soul so disquieted within me? He begins prophesying to his soul, remember God, remember the things of God, you know, like well, no matter what you win, you know, I don't like it when people of God are walking in the poor me attitude. We are not poor. God has given us everything. He's given us salvation. He's given us a life. It doesn't matter if you can't get the comfortable thing you want to get. You're not poor. You're rich. Amen. Time to start digging up the well. Spring up, O oh well, inside of me. Amen? Amen? It's a work God wants us to do. Yes. And I think, you know what? This work isn't a work somebody else can do for you. Oh, we can cultivate the well within us and speak a word of encouragement and a work of exhortation, all of those things, and, and, and acknowledge that we actually need one another. That's why we have different gifts in the church. But if we discount those things, we're going to do it on our own. Praise God, it's you and Jesus. He's capable. Even if he has to use a two by four or a four by four, or a six by six. 
Maybe he's just asking us today, church, will you take out a shovel? Recognize some of those areas that get stopped up. They weren't stopped up before. In the past generation, it was open. Something happened. There's a slide. There is something that over time, you know, things just sort of accumulated. And, and what used to flow re readily got stopped up. This is something I guess we all have to answer personally, don't we? And ask the Lord to say, Lord, what needs to be unstopped? Last thing you like in your home is a drain that's stopped up, right? You just can't flush the toilet, you can't take a shower, you can't do anything until that gets unclogged. Well, that's getting rid of stuff. I'm saying about receiving stuff. God's saying this, open up those wells, draw from me. The wise man, according to Psalm 1, is the one that plants himself by the waters, right? What happens? The roots go down deep so that in a time of famine, the leaves do not wither. They don't dry up. God wants to work in us, and he wants to do a, a great work through us. We've got to allow him to do that, allow him to do the work that he needs to do. But you know what? We've got to begin to make some decisions in our life. Will we make a greater commitment to honor him, to honor his Sabbath, to show others that this is important to us? Gather together, worship him, be challenged. You know, how many believe that we need once in a while to be encouraged to walk the walk of God? And, and the more that we sort of walk away from that and we don't hear that voice anymore, we start kind of fall into our own ways, don't we? Thank God for his word. Thank God for his people as we come together, encourage each other. Let's sing that song, you know, spring up a well. Be begin to hum that in your life. Begin to just declare it. And, and maybe you have a modern version. I don't care what version you have. But it's interesting, that was a chorus many, many years ago. Many people still remember the words or helped at least remember the tune, get some of the words together. But God is good. He'll spring up in us if we trust him to do that. I thank God for even the wilderness times. It's not a time of abandonment. It's not a time of quitting. It's a time to press in to press on, to see what God wants to do because he's preparing us for something even greater. He wants to promote you. Draw from the wells that he's given to you. Be refreshed. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this day. We bless your name. We give you praise for who you are. I thank you, Lord, that no matter what time of day that we can come to you, Lord, that we can cultivate from you what you want to do in our lives. And so, Lord, even now, Lord, by your spirit, speak to us. Is there an area in our life that you're saying, this needs to be unplugged so that we can walk in your presence? Maybe it's an area of, you haven't prayed because you're not believing anymore in prayer. But, but Lord, it's time that we begin to trust you. You're a God of miracles and we can see miracles in our lives if we trust you. You're a God of provision, and we can see those provisions as we trust you. You're a God of character, and you can form character in us as we trust you. Lord, you're bigger than our circumstance, and you're surely greater than any enemy. And so, Lord, we ask you, lead us into victory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand up.